Hello everyone, and welcome to the Ideal Spring Post Lab. So, in this lab we were trying to learn about springs and how basic what we will call ideal springs work so that we can eventually build the idea of elastic potential energy. So in this lab, you looked at two variables. Right? The force exerted by a spring, F sub S, which we measured in newtons, and the elongation of the spring, which we measured in meters. And elongation here is an X, notice. Uh, this works the same way if it's a compression spring, by the way. So when you graphed that, right, your graph was linear, and it went through 0, 0 right, on the graph. And when we make a graph of two variables, and they are both linear and go through 0, 0, it tells us that the variables are proportional to one another. Okay, this is one of the reasons it's an ideal spring. So it's a direct proportion, which not all springs work this way. Rubber bands, bungee cords, things like that might not have such beautiful straight line graphs, but these springs did. Right? So that means that if you stretch the spring twice as far, it exerted twice as much force. If you stretched it three times as far, it exerted three times as much force, as long as you didn't break the spring. Exceed what's known as the elastic limit. So given the uh, linear graph, we can of course make a y equals mx plus b math model out of this, which will allow us then to use it as a predictive tool to describe ideal springs. So the y variable in this case, what we graphed on the vertical axis, is of course the force exerted by the spring. That will equal your slope, and if we take a look at some of the slopes, right, here's a one hour's worth of slopes. Okay, right here, you'll notice that they're all fairly similar, right? Everyone has a three point something. So it's really that first decimal place where we start to get some disagreement. So that's why I rounded off to a single decimal place, two sig figs down here. So we get uh, experimentally about 3.6, okay, about 3.6 as our slope. Uh, according to the company, it ought to be about 3.5. Pretty darn close, right? But we'll talk about why there's a little bit of error in this lab. It has to do with how we did the lab. But I'm going to go with a 3.5. You, of course, should write in whatever your slope was. We need units on the slope, and to be able to interpret it, we get those, of course, from rise over run. Right? The units of rise here are newtons. The units of run are meters. So we have roughly 3.5 newtons per meter. So what does that mean? Right? What does that actually tell you about your spring? Well, I asked you, of course, to write out a for every statement. So that would be for every one meter of elongation, the spring applies an additional roughly three and a half newtons of force, or whatever your slope was. A slope is a rate of change. It tells you how much this changes when you change this. Right, so when you uh, add a meter of elongation, you get roughly an additional three and a half newtons of force. It's a very important quantity for a spring, and we're going to give it a name and talk a little bit about it in a little bit. But before we do that, let's finish off the math model here. So if that's y equals m, the x variable in this case is, yeah, it's actually x, right? It's the elongation. So we put that in. And the y-intercept? Well, it's zero. Uh, hopefully, experimentally, it's zero, right? With the 5% rule, if you take 5% of your largest force, should be quite a bit bigger than your y-intercept. Probably got a really small y-intercept when you graphed this. But it also makes sense logically, because what would it mean to have a zero, zero point on a graph of force exerted by a spring versus its elongation? Well, it would mean that when the elongation was zero, right? then the force exerted by the spring is zero. <laughs> Which is, of course, you know, the way it worked, right? The spring wasn't stretched at all until you hung some mass on it or pulled on it, right, in order to stretch it. So zero, zero here was a point and was something that you could graph. So our math model becomes a fairly straightforward force exerted by a spring equals, in this case, three and a half newtons per meter times the elongation. And this is for an ideal spring. Ideal for, again, two reasons. One, 
The linear nature of the graph, the direct proportion between the force exerted by a spring and its elongation. And secondly, because there wasn't a y-intercept. Not all springs work that way. Some springs, if you actually, if the coils are come pre-compressed, if you will, right, kind of pushed together, um, some springs need what sometimes is called a preload. You have to add a certain amount of force to them before they even start to stretch. Okay, so tougher springs are like that, right? They don't want just as the wind blows by in order to stretch the spring. You know, they want it to have to have something significant happen to it before it even starts to stretch. It kind of comes pre-compressed, okay? Um, ideal springs don't work that way. Put any force on it, right? They stretch. If you would have put just a five gram mass hanger on this spring, would have stretched, right? So that's why it's an ideal spring, right? Um, direct proportion between the variables and no y-intercept. Now, that slope, if you want to check, right, you can see how far off uh, we were. And we weren't very far off. We had a 3.6, right? So, you know, what? what is that? It's not even a percent error, right? So we were very close to that. You can see where you were. Um, you know, biggest one here was about 3.8 uh, on the high side. And even that's not that far off, right? But why? Why didn't they get, why didn't you all get exactly what the company said it should be? And some of you did to two sig figs, right? But why didn't all of you get that? Well, there's really two things. One of them has to do with how you did the lab, and one of them has to do with the equipment, right? So one of them is just how good could you measure the elongation, right? How precisely could you do that? How closely did you measure it? Some of you might have been a little better at that, right? And estimating and using the meter stick and that kind of thing. And the other thing is, as some of you might have noticed, um, some of these springs are a little bit damaged, right? They may not have been in perfect shape. They've been used for years. Hopefully none of you destroyed your spring, right? And so it's has it been deformed permanently already by some other group, right? Now, none of them are bad, right? None of them are that far off. Otherwise, I would replace them. But, you know, over the years, they kind of get a little stretched out and maybe they don't work as well. Right? So I think over the years, we get a little bit more error um, than we would have had otherwise. But those are really the two biggest sources of error, right? How do we measure the elongation? And we could have gone in much more high-tech ways, but we did it in a low-tech way. right? And then how? what was the quality of your spring? But again, really barely any error. right? So this 3.5 the company claims that it should be is a... Is a pretty good uh, measurement of what it actually worked out to be. Now, the last question I asked you on your lab sheet is important, which was, what does that slope really tell you about your spring? Well, it tells you how much force it takes to stretch a meter, but what is that? Well, that's something that we call the spring constant. It's denoted in an equation by a lowercase k, k for constant, I guess, c something else, so spring constant. Um, this is the slope of the graph, right? Uh, but it's also a little more conceptually a measure of the strength or elasticity of a spring. Right? So it's basically how strong the spring is. Right? Springs with a greater spring constant, if it had a spring constant of 100, that means it would take 100 newtons to stretch a meter, right? Yours was a very weak spring. It only took roughly about three and a half uh, newtons to stretch a meter, right? Not much at all. So this is a really important number. In fact, if you go to like the Home Depot Wall O Springs, this is how the springs are going to be rated. You usually see right on them, right? It, it might be in newtons and meters. It might be in pounds and inches or something like that. But it's going to have a strength rating to the spring, which is its spring constant. And of course, for an ideal spring, that spring constant is in fact a constant, right? Because the graph is linear, so the slope is the same. Uh, Unless, of course, you exceed the elastic limit and destroy the spring, right? then things change. Again, that's one of the things that makes it ideal is that we have a, an actual spring constant that's the same all the time. doesn't work that way with bungee cords and rubber bands and things. It might to a certain extent, maybe part of the stretch, but you know, uh, at other points it's not going to work as well. So that's why we tend to use nice cylindrical springs that have these nice spring constants that you can use and therefore have a nice predictable pattern. So if we plug that K in for the uh, slope that we actually got, we get 
The force exerted by the spring is equal to the spring constant times its elongation. Or, by the way, compression. Right? Ideal compression springs work the same way. I just didn't have any of those for lab. Now, there is one other idea that we got to get here, and that is that, if you'll notice here, these are all scalars. I didn't put any arrows on anything, right? We didn't deal with the vector nature. I didn't ask during the lab which direction were you stretching the spring or which direction was it pulling. But think about that for a second. What is the relationship between the direction the force pulls, or sorry, the spring pulls, and the direction it's stretched? And be careful there. We're talking not about the force you put on the spring, but the force the spring put back on you. So if you stretch a spring, if you stretch it out to the right, what direction does it pull on you? Yeah, to the left. If you stretch it up, it would pull down. If you stretched it down, it would pull up. If you stretched it to the left, it would pull to the right. It always pulls back to its original shape. So therefore, the force exerted by the spring and its elongation are always in opposite directions. That's kind of interesting. So if we want to turn this math model into a vector equation, we have to put an indication in there that the force exerted by the spring and the elongation are opposite. And to do that, we drop in a negative sign. Notice I put an arrow now above the force exerted by the spring and the elongation. The spring constant is just a number. It's a scalar. It's just the strength of the spring. Right, so the negative sign here is not because the spring constant is negative. It's because the force exerted by the spring and its elongation, or compression, are always in opposite direction. And if you compress a spring in, it pushes out. Right, always in the opposite direction. So this is a little more complete of an expression. Now that would change our graph. Right, and we'll talk about that in a second. But this relationship for ideal springs was first found by a contemporary of Sir Isaac Newton's, a guy by the name of Robert Hooke. So this is classically known as Hooke's Law. Robert Hooke was uh, quite a character. He was kind of the nemesis to Sir Isaac Newton. Um, anytime Isaac came out with something, put out a paper, said he discovered something, Hooke would basically say, uh, oh, uh, I already knew that, and uh, you know, so I'm really the one that discovered it. And he would always try to take credit for everything. And him and uh, Newton often had quite a lot of fights. They were not friends. Hooke also did work in, in other areas, uh, more in chemistry and things as well as physics, but a contemporary and, and enemy of Isaac Newton's. So with this negative sign, right, and this holds for ideal springs, right, our graph, instead of being in the first quadrant, is going to be in either the second or the fourth quadrants. Why? Because these are the quadrants where one of the things is positive and one is negative. Right? So depending on the direction, maybe in the second quadrant, we are stretching the spring to the right, positive, and it's pulling. I'm sorry, we're stretching it to the right and it's pulling to the left, so that would be fourth quadrant. Right? Or we're stretching it to the left and it's pulling to the right, second quadrant. A little tricky with these vectors things, even for me. All right, so our graphs would be here instead, right? Usually one quadrant, but you will quite often see, like for example, on the worksheet you're going to do, um, you will see this drawn out in the first quadrant and we'll just kind of ignore the vectors. But there will be cases when we need to consider the vector nature of this. Often, uh, when we're drawing a force diagram or we're doing something like that, we need to consider the direction that the force exerted by a spring is actually acting. So again, this is what is known as Hooke's Law for ideal springs, where the force and the elongation are proportional to one another, opposite in direction, and related by the spring constant, the strength of the spring.